The Sahara and its surroundings are truly harsh territories. It's hard to survive here, so farming or growing plants is out of the question. But apparently that was the case until recently. Yes, it's really the surroundings of the Sahara, arid, barren. Until these crescent-shaped pits started showing up, because of them, plants get the main resource they need to live, and then they grow and eventually turn into real thickets. But there's one catch. None of these pits were filled with water. It appeared there on its own. That's right, water showed up where fresh water is generally a big problem. How's this even possible? Let's find out. Let's start with a simple question. Has anyone ever thought about how important soil is for our entire planet? Back in 2006, scientists suggested that 25% of all life on Earth is linked to soil. A quarter of all species live right beneath our feet. However, in 2023, research showed that previous estimates were a bit low. Now we know that 59% of all species live in the soil, more than half. The most notable creatures on our planet, mammals, make up only 3%. But if you take a closer look, or better yet, arm yourself with a microscope, you'll find that 90% of fungi, 85% of plants, and over 50% of bacteria live underground. Try taking a teaspoon of what's under your feet and then look at it closely. It turns out it's not just some mass where you might randomly spot a worm, but a huge metropolis inhabited by up to a billion bacteria and a lot of fungi. Besides life, soil is a mix of water, gases, minerals, and organic matter, which combined with all the creatures living there makes it the reason we're still alive on this planet. Also, 95% of the world's food grows in the soil. Almost all fruits, vegetables, grains, they're all things that only survive there. Basically, the soil is a source of food, without which it's incredibly hard, if not impossible, for a person to live. But what if we look at it from the financial side? Without good soil, there's no good harvest, and that means no money for the survival of the huge number of people whose only livelihood is farming. Have you ever thought about why underground water is often ready to drink right away? Why is it almost always free of pollution? You drill a well, pump it up, and then drink it. All the bacteria and other species living in the soil, along with the minerals and elements found there, act as a filter. The soil can trap all harmful chemicals, so what reaches the gathering point is already clean and ready for use. On top of that, the soil is the largest carbon catcher on our planet after the ocean and holds more harmful elements than all the land plants combined. In general, it's a vital part of our planet and all life. But right now, the soil is facing major problems. About 30% of the soil on the planet has degraded for various reasons. Everything from excessive farming to climate change has played a part. And the scariest part is that by 2050, 90% of land will be degraded. Fortunately, humanity has a simple and effective solution to combat this dangerous process. To look at it, we need to move to Africa, specifically Niger. Out of around 23 million people, 17 million in this African country are engaged in agriculture. 14% of GDP comes from livestock farming, breeding camels, sheep, and cattle. The majority of GDP comes from growing crops like pearl millet, sorghum, and cassava. They also grow cowpeas and onions, small quantities of garlic, peppers, potatoes, and wheat. And yes, an amazing fact, all of this is happening despite the fact that 80% of the country is covered by the Sahara. You could say that Niger is almost entirely in the embrace of the desert. Harsh, lifeless land with 104 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and below freezing temperatures at night, plus dusty storms. That's why Niger has focused its agriculture in the southern part of the country, near the border with Nigeria. The soil there is at least semi-arid, not just sand. The temperature here is also much better, so farming is just a lot easier. I think we can all agree the heat isn't exactly comfortable for plants or people. In the south of Niger, they get between 12 to 24 inches of rain every year, which is just unbelievably much compared to the northern parts of the country, where you can be lucky to get a few inches. However, there are still problems. Precipitation is not evenly distributed throughout the months. In other words, at certain points, the entire month's worth of rain might fall all at once, and then you won't see any rain for a couple of months. The scariest part is that the time between normal rains is getting longer because of climate change. As a result, when long droughts happen, the soil turns into a surface that can't absorb moisture. Then, when the rain finally comes, the water just runs off in huge amounts, destroying everything in its path. And after that, it's drought again. The soil didn't soak any water, and planting crops becomes harder. The scale of the problem is unbelievable. And that's not all. As we mentioned, 80% of Niger is covered by the Sahara Desert, and as you know, deserts have a way of spreading. Do you understand what I mean? 
Sahara is gradually swallowing up the country. Day by day, year by year, Niger's territory is getting smaller. And then a brilliant and simple solution comes up, which kills several birds with one stone. The constant desertification, the rare rainfall, and the transformation of the soil into a surface that doesn't absorb moisture. Yes, it's those very half moons. It's safe to say that this solution is quite simple. However, only when compared to similar methods. In reality, digging such a hole, especially when there's no machinery or proper training, is an extremely labor-intensive task. Even with the handy traditional tool called the djembe, making one half moon takes several hours. The reason is simple. A lot of digging. A typical pit has a diameter of 6 to 26 or even up to 39 feet and a height of 12 to 20 inches. Plus, for each hole you dig, you need to put the right seeds or young plants in it. That also takes time. On top of that, it's not enough just to dig a hole and leave it as is. Annual maintenance for one hole takes roughly one person month. And then there's the need to prepare the soil. That's even more time and effort. For example, preparing 2.5 acres with half moons takes between two and four person months depending on the soil and surrounding conditions. You think these problems concern the residents of Niger? Absolutely not, because in return they get tons of benefits. First off, no one fills the half moons with water, but seeds do grow in them and everything. How's that possible? Half moons are placed in a checkerboard pattern on slopes of up to 15%. Then, when the long-awaited rain falls from the sky, the water doesn't just flow randomly down the slope, but fills the pits. These pits can also be used on flat ground. They still trap the water that would otherwise just flow away during the rain. It's basically a little dam which keeps the water in the right place, allowing it to soak in and turn the soil into fertile land. Can you imagine how much easier this makes things? Especially for the people in Niger who typically have to walk for miles to get water and spend hours doing so. The pits also capture and hold organic matter which attracts termites and other invertebrates whose actions lead to the creation of nutrient-rich hummus for plants as well as better water infiltration. In other words, it results in good, fertile soil. Because a small water dam kept the moisture and made the soil fertile, a transformation happens and it happens pretty quickly. At first, only a bit of greenery shows up around the half moons, and then there are more plants, and then even more. Look at these photos. A complete transformation of the area happened in just four years. Over time, it's hard to imagine that the area was once a barren desert. Now, only small reminders remain between the half moons. However, soon there are no more reminders at all. Since the ground between the pits also soaks up the stored moisture, all the areas between them gradually turn green and fertile. The effectiveness of this solution is clear even to the naked eye as the barren land is turned green. But if you need proof, it's there. For example, from 1970 to 2010, thanks to small dams in Niger, millet yields increased by 397 pounds and straw by 880 pounds per 2.5 acres per year. The production of feed and wood also went up. On the land covered with half moons, a variety of plants appeared, attracting animals. But the most important thing is that the need for irrigation water decreased and food security and self-sufficiency improved. And you know what else half moons can do? Something not so obvious. They can change the weather. The plants that grow thanks to the pits are able to carry out photosynthesis, during which they release water into the air. This creates a cooling effect. The plants also release other compounds, which scientists believe could eventually even lead to cloud formation. To check this, the people of Niger need to keep digging, no matter how tough the work is. However, they already had the motivation to dig the half moons, even without any changes in the weather. As we've mentioned before, these green islands help stop desertification, namely the expansion of the Great and Terrible Sahara, which keeps trying to swallow everything in its path. And this is no exaggeration meant to scare anyone. Here in Africa, 20 countries, including Niger, are working together to fight the Sahara by building the Great Green Wall. The main opponents of the desert, who are on the front lines, are easy to find on a map. Just draw a line where the desert ends and the green area begins. By the way, they're building the Green Wall roughly along that line. Each of these countries is committed to building the Green Wall through the cultivation of pastures and farmlands. And by the way, the half moons we talked about today really help with that. The people behind the initiative are also providing protection by planting trees, which work wonders in stopping the spread of the dry Sahara to the south. When it comes to progress, it's significant, though unevenly spread across countries. 
For example, in 2019, there was news that Senegal planted over 11 million trees, while Ethiopia went all out and planted 5.5 billion saplings. Meanwhile, Chad only planted about 1.1 million trees, the future building blocks of the Great Green Wall. Besides that, there was information that Nigeria restored 10 million acres of degraded land, while Ethiopia got back as much as 37 million acres. In general, the data turned out to be quite scarce, which, by the way, is a big problem for the initiative. However, even based on this, you can say some are working harder on protecting against the Sahara and others are doing less. It's clear that countries differ in their capabilities. For example, some can't dig half moons on the scale that Niger does. Some can't provide enough saplings and everything else needed to green the land. And some are under attack by insects. While everything in nature has its role, the desert locust. These pests can gather into massive swarms and then, like a swift storm, swoop down on the restored vegetation, and that's it. It'll be gone. Once again, the land will be dry with no greenery. It's because of locusts that some countries arrange less green spaces than others. Besides that, along the line where they're building the Great Green Wall, there are different active factions, and the people in them couldn't care less about any projects to protect from the Sahara. They have their own goals, and they're not about anything good. As a result, due to all the issues, by 2019, only 15% of the wall was completed, and in 2024, there was information that the wall is only 30% ready. Why only? Because the official construction started in 2007, and they plan to finish it by 2030. Well, you get it, in 15 years, 30% done. Doesn't seem likely that in the remaining five years, they'll finish the other 70%. However, despite the slow progress, thanks to tree planting and many other greening efforts, including the creation of half moons, by 2024, 74 million acres of degraded land had already been restored. This is already a huge achievement, an example of how even in the toughest African conditions, countries can fight a grand threat moving south across the continent. But why is the Sahara only being fenced off from the south? It's hard to believe it picked a direction and is moving only that way. Actually, it didn't choose. The desert is expanding in every direction it can, including to the north. In the north, they're also trying to block the desert, but the main fighter there is Algeria, which has been building its wall since the 1960s, or rather its dam, the Great Green Dam. Building such a dam was a huge necessity for Algeria because even without the Sahara expanding, the country's territory is pretty much one big desert. Algeria's total area is 588 million acres, of which 494 million acres are natural deserts and 49 million acres are steppe areas threatened by desertification. Overall, the country managed to defend itself from the Sahara by planting and restoring existing forests over an area of 620 miles long and 12 miles wide. However, recently the Great Green Wall has faced problems, part of the forest has deteriorated, and it's been less and less effective at stopping the desert's advance. The response to this has been plans for reforestation over 988,000 acres and expanding forest cover to 12 million acres by 2027. In short, they're also fencing off the northern Sahara, which means land degradation is probably not happening as quickly as it could thanks to this greening effort. And here's another question. Are there other ways to prevent the desert from spreading? Are there other ways to protect the soil from degradation besides half moons and just planting plants? Yes, there are. And the solution was found by Alan Savory, who spent 60 years researching across six different continents. So yeah, this guy really knows his stuff. This scientist discovered that one of the causes of desertification is the overly limited grazing of livestock. The thing is, when cows roam around semi-arid land, they help speed up the biological breakdown of the plant leaves that die off every year, and they also trample the plant material, which creates a fertile soil cover. If the cows aren't grazing, then under the sun's effect, this dying plant material simply breaks down through chemical oxidation instead of biological decay. In short, without cows or other large livestock, everything useful just disappears, not creating a fertile cover. And without it, the surface gradually turns into semi-arid land and then into a desert. The same thing happens in many African countries. What needs to be done to avoid this? Obviously, let the cows roam. Okay, actually, it's more complicated. Alan Savory and the institute named after him call the solution holistic planned grazing. 
According to it, farmers need to meet up and come up with a grazing plan that'll take place at the right time and place with the right frequency. If you're a farmer and this already seems complicated, well, the challenges of this method don't end here. Besides planning every move of the herd, it's important to mark which areas will be covered by snow or are prone to fires, when and where ground nesting birds lay their eggs. This all impacts the grazing plan, so it needs to be noted and analyzed. It sounds complicated, but the solution is really effective, judging by these shots. This shows the area where grazing wasn't done according to Savory's approach. It doesn't look too barren, but in fact the process of turning it into a lifeless zone has already begun. There's almost no grass between the trees. They stand far apart from each other and aren't connected by greenery. Here on the other hand, you can see the area where the planned grazing took place. There's a lot more greenery. We hope something like this will be tried in countries that are dealing with the effects of soil degradation, for example in Niger, where they actively use half moons for farming, or in other countries that are trying to contain the Sahara Desert because it's causing soil degradation, and pretty much everywhere with these kinds of problems. If nothing changes by 2050, 90% of the planet's soil will be degraded, so we need to try different ways to save ourselves from this catastrophic process. Holes, grazing cattle, anything goes. And even bananas in the forest. Well, you probably remember that video.